Good morning and welcome to today's AEI policy event, Government Policies Reshape the Banking Industry, Changes, Consequences, and Policy Issues. My name is Paul Kubiak, I'm an AEI resident scholar. Let me introduce today's topic by giving a quick tour of some of the important changes that have occurred in the banking industry over the last 20 years and some reasons we may see these changes. First, let's take a look at the evolution of the banking sector in the context of the overall US financial system. My first chart taken from a recent AEI working paper that's available online shows the growth of the indebtedness of different sectors of the economy compared to growth in nominal GDP. The indebtedness of the federal government is shown in red, non-financial businesses in blue and household and nonprofits in green. As you can see, each of these sectors outstanding debt grew faster than US nominal GDP, but by far and away, the federal government posted the largest increase in outstanding debt. US nominal GDP doubled over this 20 year period. At the same time, the federal government's debt was 5.6 times larger in the second quarter of 2020 than it was in the year 2000. All debt has to be financed by someone. My next chart shows the share of the total outstanding debt securities and loans held by the five largest investor groups, depository institutions or banks, the Federal Reserve System, government sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and other agencies, mutual funds and life insurance companies. Over this 20 year period, the share of debt, total debt owned by banks declined slightly from 19% in 2000 to 18.2% in the third quarter of 2020. The share financed by life insurance companies also declined. Groups with increasing shares include the government sponsored enterprises, which grew by a little over two percentage points and mutual funds, which grew by three percentage points. The biggest increase over this period was the share of outstanding debt owned by the Federal Reserve, which grew from 1.8% in 2000 to 8.79% in the second quarter of 2020. Of course, the increase in the Fed share owes to the Fed's aggressive post-crisis securities, QE, QE securities purchases. The total amount of outstanding debt in the US grew faster than US nominal GDP, but the share of funds provided by the banking system declined slightly. Still, my next chart shows that the total assets of the banking system grew faster than nominal GDP, but after 2007, the year the US adopted Basel II bank capital regulations, the growth in the banking system loans no longer kept pace with the growth in banking system assets. You can see on the chart, the difference between the dark black line and the dotted black line. The, the banking system includes individual banks of various sizes and specializations. Post-financial crisis banking regulations treat banks of different sizes differently. They impose the most constraining bank capital and liquidity requirements on the largest systemically important institutions. To see how these changes in regulations coincided with impacted banking operations in the banks in different size classes, I decomposed the banks into five different asset size groups and examined how each group's characteristics change over time. My next chart shows the total asset in each bank size group since 2000. The trend towards concentration in the banking system is clearly evident. The assets held by the largest banks, banks with assets in excess of 250 billion, were almost nine times larger in 2020 quarter three than they were in 2000. In contrast, assets held by banks in the smallest four size categories, banks inside all, all of which have assets less than 100 billion, failed to double over this period. In other words, banks in these smaller size categories grew more slowly than GDP. My next chart shows the share of banks at assets invested in primary asset categories owned by banks, which are net loans and leases, securities, cash, and balances due from federal depository institutions, trading account assets, and other assets. A clear pattern emerges. The volume of banking system assets dedicated to loans and leases shrinks after the adoption of Basel II in 2007, as does the share of bank assets dedicated to trading. 
Offsetting these are, in, the, these are increases in the share of banking system assets dedicated to securities and cash balances due from depository institutions, including and especially those due from the Federal Reserve System banks. The reduction in the dollar volume of banking system assets dedicated to business and con consumer loans and leases owes primarily to the reduction in loan shares of the largest banks. The dollar volume of loans remains roughly stagnant from 2009 to 2012. When banking system assets began to grow, grow in 2013, the dollar volume in loans and leases did not. Coincidence or not, the US adopted Basel III regulatory capital standard in 2013, which increased the regulatory capital banks need to have to make, to have to, have to hold loans and leases, with the increase especially large for systemically important banks. My next chart depicts the share of bank assets dedicated to loans and leases by bank asset size category. Banks in the smallest three category size categories have maintained or even increased the share of their assets inv invested in business and consumer loans. In contrast, the share of assets invested in loans at the largest banks has declined from nearly 60% in 2000 to a historically low 40% in the most recent data. The next chart shows for banks in the largest size category, the share of assets invested in federal, reserve, in federal government guaranteed securities and federal reserve deposits increased by 22 percentage points over the past 20 years and is now over 30% for the largest banks. The increase was almost as large for, for, uh, almost as large for banks in the second biggest size category. According to the latest data, this group on average holds about 28% of their assets in these investments. The increase in securities holding accelerated after the U.S. adoption of Basel III, which imposes new minimum li liquidity capital requirements on the largest institutions. I am sure that many of you are familiar with stories about increases in bank regulatory capital mandated by Dodd-Frank heightened prudential standards and Basel III capital rules. While the largest banks on average did increase their equity to asset ratios over these periods, these ratios have more recently fallen from their post-crisis highs and are actually only about one point one eight percentage points higher than they were in 2007. Banks in the second largest size ca category on average have lower equity asset ratios than they did in 2007. While the equity asset to ratios of largest banks increased by a percentage point or even fell slightly, these banks dramatically increased the share of their funding raised using federally insured deposits and deposits that are implicitly federally insured. The next chart, shows banks in all size categories increased the share of their deposit funding, but the increase was by far the largest for the largest banks. Banks in all size categories now fund more than 80% of their assets with deposits. The next chart shows that increased reliance in deposit funding was used to replace subordinated debt, a source of funding that used to be important at large banks. The next chart, shows that the increase in deposits was also used to replace borrowed federal funds and funds borrowed using repurchase agreements at larger banks. These last two features are notable for financial stability purposes because subordinated debt owners are investors who lend to banks using and, and investors who lend to bank using repurchase agreements and Fed funds are at risk of loss should the issuing depository institution fail. Depositors at large banks are always protected because of the way the FDIC resol resolves large failing institutions. Because they are at risk, subordinated debt holders, Fed funds and repo lenders have historically been the most active monitors of a borrowing bank's going concern status. These investors run at the first sign of an institution's problems, either by refusing to roll, roll over maturing loans or by substantially raising the interest rate charged. These investors have always been the canary in the coal mine that alerted market participants and bank regulators that a bank had a problem. Now monitoring of the largest bank relies primarily on federal banking regulators, a group that has a checkered history when it comes to prescience and transparency. <laughs> My last slide summarizes the state of the banking system circa 2021. The banking system has become more concentrated and more reliant on the federal government, both for guarantees and implicit guarantees bank used to secure funding and for a significant share of large banks' investments, where 30% of bank assets are used to fund the federal government or federally government-guaranteed investments. 
Banks would not need to rely on the federal on federal guarantees to raise funds if they follow prudent capital and liquidity management policies. Without federal guarantees, raising 80% of a bank's funding needs using deposits would not be prudent bank management. Creditworthy customers and business borrowers do not need special government guarantee programs to secure bank credit at fair rates. While increased government fiscal expenditures funded in part by banks will no doubt directly increase GDP in the short run, there is little doubt that government guarantees and regulatory interventions used to distribute scarce bank credit do not result in capital being allocated to the highest and most productive use. What are the implications for productivity and future economic growth? To answer this and other important questions, AEI has assembled a panel of experts whose knowledge on all issues related to banking is legendary. Speaking in, in the order in which they're speaking, my panelists include Professor Richard Silla. Let me stop the screen share. My panelists include Professor R Richard Silla. Professor Silla, before he retired from teaching at New York University School of Business, was the Henry Kaufman Professor of the History of Financial Institutions and Markets. Professor Silla is the author of several books, including The American Capital Market and A History of Interest Rates, and his writings have appeared in numerous academic publications. He served as president of the Economic History Association and the Business History Conference, and is currently the chairman of the Museum of American Finance. He's a fellow of the Cleometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an NBR fellow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, speaking second will be Alex J. Pollock, who is a distinguished senior fellow with the R Street Institute in Washington, DC. Alex has a wide ranging interest and expertise in all things financial. He has written on cycles of booms and busts, financial crisis and their political responses, housing finance, government-sponsored enterprises, risk and uncertainty, central banking, banking and financial regulation, corporate governance, retirement finance, student loans, and the politics of finance. Alex was president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. He has been a resident scholar at AEI and more recently at R Street Institute. Alex has just finished serving as principal Deputy Director of the Office of Financial Research in the U.S. Treasury Department. Speaking third will be Professor Charlie, Charles W. Calamaris, who is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia Business School and a Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He recently served as Chief Economist and Senior Deputy Controller at the Office of the Controller of the Currency. Professor Calamaris is a member of the Financial Economist Roundtable, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, a distinguished fellow at the Hoover Institution, where he co-directed the Initiative on Regulation and the Rule of Law for many years. Professor Calamare's research spans banking, monetary economics, corporate finance, and financial history. His recent books include Fragile by Design, The Political Origins of Banking Crisis and Scarce Credit with Stephen Haber, and Reforming Financial Regulation after Dodd-Frank, Manhattan Institute, 2017, and he's edited volumes of Rules of, for the Lender of Last Resort in the Journal of Financial Intermediation. And he's working on assessing banking regulation. No, I'm sorry. He's finished assessing banking regulation during the Obama era, which was published in the Journal of Financial Intermediation in 2018. He is currently working on a book entitled Useless History and the, and the Future of Banking. Speaking forth today is Bert Ely, who has who has consulted on deposit insurance and banking issues since 1981. Bert continuously monitors conditions in the banking industry as well as monetary policy. In recent years, he has focused his attention on banking regulation, housing finance reform, and the resolution of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac conservatorships. Bert has written extensively on issues like the SNL crisis, banking regulation, housing finance reform, the resolution of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac conservatorships, the farm credit system, cryptocurrencies, and the under, underlying blockchain technology. Bert also serves as an expert, expert witness as a, and has testified on numerous occasions before congressional committees on banking issues. He often speaks on these matters to bankers and others. Now I would like to turn the, turn the tables over to Professor Silla. Thank you. 
Welcome, Professor Silla. Thank you, Paul, um, and look forward to a, an interesting discussion today. Let me share uh, some things I wanted to show here. Uh, share, and does that look okay? Looks okay. All right. Um, there, there was a previous slide, I guess, if, if that goes back. Let's see, how, how do I move back to the, well. Anyway, this is, it's okay with we go here. I had a, a introductory uh, slide, but that's not important. Um, this is a, um, uh, and I hope everybody can see it. The right part of it is cut off on my, by the Zoom screens on, on my uh, screen right now. But uh, what I wanted to talk today about was uh, the, the, what happened in the last hundred years. Uh, and we could, I think it's a good background for this discussion. And it turns out that our current year, 2021, is the 100th anniversary, which you may not know about. And the, the, it's, it's the 100th anniversary of the peak number of banks in US history. Uh, in 1921, the US banking system had no fewer than 30,456 independent banks. Um, this is kind of a remarkable development from uh, 1782 when the first bank opened its doors and even when the government under George Washington came into office in 1789, there were only three banks in the country. Fast forward to 1921 and there are 30,400 banks. And, and you can see here that uh, if you can see my arrow, uh, there's a steady decline, 1929, 24,000, 1933, 14,000, 1984, 14,000 again, not very much change. Uh, and then uh, from 1984 to 2008, the number of banks is cut in more than in half. And in 2018, uh, the last figure I had, uh, this uh, uh, table is drawn from an article I published in uh, the Financial History Review just in December 2020. Um, we were down to 4,700 banks and we've lost a couple of the, uh, the data from the FDIC that I used. Uh, uh, I have an, uh, another year available. I'll show that on my next screen. Um, so this is, a, you know, the a long term is uh, uh, study shows that there's a really substantial decline in the number of banks. But I'll, I'll say a little bit about each one of these changes. Um, most of the banks in 1921, what were called unit banks, almost 30,000 of the 30 and a half thousand were unit banks and banks with branches. That, that's what I'm not seeing here because the Zoom uh, figures are covering up the last column of my table. Um, but I, I have it here. The banks with banks that had branches in 1921 were only 547. Uh, each one of these eras, I'll say a little word about from 1921 to 1929, this was the Roaring Twenties, but the U.S. banking system lost about uh, five, more than five thousand banks in that period, and these no, nobody really noticed it uh, uh, very much um, because uh, you know the economy was prosperous, as we know, in the 1920s. If you look at where these banks were, they were mostly out in agricultural regions in the center of the country, you know, from, from the Dakotas on down to Texas. Uh, and agriculture was not sharing in the prosperity of the 1920s. And so a lot of very small banks failed, but it didn't really have much effect on the American economy. But it was a substantial decline even before the Great Depression. The big decline, which we're all familiar with, 25,000 banks in 1929, 14,000 in 1933. And this was not a case of Midwestern agriculture uh, losing banks. This, the whole country, every state lost banks in this period. And that's a pretty history that's pretty well known. Uh, and But we, still, most of the banks were unit banks. And even in 1933, almost all the banks were unit banks. You come to 1984, and bank numbers hardly change at all. And th this was a result, I think, of the New Deal's banking regulations, which you know, we were chastened by all the bank failures. So we wanted to make it very hard for any banks to fail at all. And uh, 
you know, I often describe this as something like a cartel that came in there where the government didn't want banks to fail. So it regulated their interest rates. And these were the glorious days of what were called 363 banking, where the bankers didn't have a lot of competition. So they would borrow at 3%, lend at 6% and be on the first tee of the golf course at 3 p.m. That was a very stable period uh, and sort of a cartel uh, where banks were not allowed to fail. And one way you could prevent that was by cutting down on the competition in banking. And uh, that meant that um, uh, bank entry was uh, pretty strictly regulated. Uh, nonetheless, during this period, uh, more and more banks opened branches. So you know, by 1984, there were 42,000 branches where there'd hardly been any. So branch banking was coming in. Total offices were up to nearly 60,000. And unit banks were still more than half of all banks. I think this is, I can't see my last column over here, but... The banks, unit banks were 7,400 in uh, 1984 and branch banks were just about 7,000. So unit banks still dominated the system. That has changed greatly in the last, uh, uh, what, 30, 40 years, uh, 40 some years, uh, where uh, if you come to the end of the table, there are only 879 unit banks now and 3,000 800 are, are basically ranks with branches. That gets us to 40, uh, 4,700 banks in, in 1918, the last date I had when I wrote this. So the banking system uh, had four, one, two, th- three periods where it shrank a lot in terms of the numbers of banks, and then one period of fi- half, half a century where banking was fairly stable. Uh, and I remember that kind of banking system when I was young. Bankers were, uh, you know, you were not uh, the competitive type people that they became uh, later on. So um, in terms of the rate of change uh, that we might talk about, uh, if I could go to my next slide here now, how do I go to the next slide? Uh, I just go like that. I'm having trouble changing to the, the next. Page, page down, Dick. Page down? On your screen, yeah. Page down. Or, or arrow down. Okay, I'm doing that, but nothing is happening. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Where, let's see here. Where is the? Can you do it on your keyboard? Oh, that's what I'm trying to do, but uh, page down. Now that's not working. I seem to be stuck on this slide. You use the right arrow. The right arrow. Oh, okay, there we are. Thank you. Uh, one more year of data came available since I did this. And, and in the going from this is the FDIC's data, 2019, the comparable data to 2018, this is what you might call the rate of change in American banking. And in 2019, this was before the pandemic, uh, we lost another 200 commercial banks. By the way, these are com- just commercial banks. So there are other kinds of depository institutions, I guess, that uh, are not commercial banks. Um, the number of branches went down by uh, nearly 1,200 in the year 19, nine, uh, 2019. The number of offices went down by uh, 1,300. Uh, unit banks went down by 40 and branch banks went down by 159. So um, the, the trends of the last uh, 30 or 40 years seem to be continuing where the banking system is getting smaller in terms of the number of institutions. Uh, I think until um, uh, recent years, the number of branches went up. But in, if you go back to the previous table, which uh, you um, uh, can see that uh, you know, branches kept going up until 2008. But now in the last decade up to 2018, the number of branches is going down, the number of offices is going down. Uh, So uh, I'm wondering with these changes in one year where all the numbers in my previous table are going down, uh, I I have to wonder whether our banking industry is an industry in decline. It obviously was a growth industry when we went from one bank in 1782 to 30,000 banks. 
And by the way, that happened to be the largest banking system in the world. I think the U.S. is no longer the largest banking system in the world. That honor may belong to China now, but uh, in the 1920. Uh, one and even even before World War One, it was not an effect of World War One. The assets, uh, the deposits of the U.S. banking system, uh, were equal to the combined assets or deposits of the next uh, lar three largest banking systems, which were those of the U.K., France, and Germany. And if you added the U.K., France, and Germany together, uh, they barely equaled the size of the U.S. banking system in 1921. So we had a very strange banking system. And I would urge people to read Charlie Calamaris's book with Steve Haber to find out how it got to be that way. And the title of the paper that I mentioned that I'm basing these remarks on was called From Exceptional to Normal. Uh, changes in the structure of U.S. banking over the past century. And our banking system was very much unlike the banking systems of the rest of the world and having so many independent unit banks. Uh, but it was a very large banking system. And what I think I see in the last century is that the U.S. banking system has come to look more like the banking systems of other leading economies, where you have a, a relatively small number of large banks with extensive branch systems. That's what we didn't have for most of our history. And obviously the, regul the deregulations of the 1990s had a lot to do with that when we you know, got nationwide banking finally after a couple hundred years of restricting that. Um, but the trends to me suggests that maybe our banking system is a system, an industry in decline. And I think that's a good way to turn it over to the real experts on what's going on in American banking. Uh, you know, but keep in mind that the banking system today is very different from what it was 100 or even 50 years ago. And uh, some of the trends uh, make me wonder whether the industry is in decline. So with that, I guess I'll turn it over to my good friend, Alex Pollack, who's uh, the next speaker uh, today. Alex? Thank you, Dick. Uh, I'll stop my share. Thanks, Dick, and thanks, Paul, for organizing this very interesting conference and for your paper, uh, an exhaustive analysis of the reshaping of the banking industry since the year 2000. And the audience will be glad to know, I'm sure, uh, that I will not be discussing each of your 67 charts and slides, uh, but adding some historical perspective on a few key points. Uh, first and obviously, on the last 20 years, drastic concentration of the banking system assets. Several banks now have assets in excess of a trillion dollars with JP Morgan and the Bank of America up at about $3 trillion each. To put this into historical perspective, uh, when I was a bank trainee in 1970, a $10 billion bank was a huge bank. Uh, in fact, if you had 10 billion in assets that got you in those days into the top 10 banks in the world. Now, uh, to go from 10 billion to 1 trillion, uh, it is obviously a factor of 100, the sum of which is the endemic inflation uh, of the Federal Reserve, but most of which is structural change, as, uh, as Paul points out. The biggest bank in the world in 1970 was the Bank of America, the one in San Francisco that no longer exists as an independent uh, company. It had assets of $25 billion, the largest bank in the world. Uh, Three trillion is more than 100 times that. A second point, Paul emphasized the biggest banks now have only about 40% of their assets in private sector uh, loans to businesses and uh, individuals. Of course, this reflects uh, their becoming universal banks instead of the more narrow uh, uh, commercial banks of uh, uh, most of, uh, well, of the US history since the 1930s. Uh, now we can take a symbol of this universal banking uh, uh, in that the current version of the Bank of America owns Merrill Lynch, uh, the famous stock brokering firm, and no one thinks anything about it. Although in previous decades, that would have been a huge political issue. Uh, it's not now. Uh, so now we've got bigger, the biggest banks, which are more diversified businesses, 
And it's good to remember that the traditional business of banks of making loans on a highly leveraged basis is the riskiest part of banking. Uh, as I was uh, told long ago and have always remembered, banking is the only business where when you have made the sale, you give the customer the money. But think about that one. Um, third, uh, the balance sheets, as Paul pointed out, of the biggest banks are more and more committed to government guaranteed assets and dependent on government guaranteed liabilities, either uh, with explicit or implicit guarantees. Are these biggest banks too big to fail? Of course they are. For all the talk over decades now about how terrible too big to fail is, it is as much in force as ever, uh, probably even more so. In short, banking structure is entwined with the government, just as Charlie Calamaris' work constantly shows us. And banking uh, everywhere has been, is, and will be a shifting deal between the bankers and the politicians. And Paul has nicely pointed out how some of these shifts uh, have transpired over the last couple of decades. Uh, Dick Silla, instructively, has gone back a hundred years and, uh, as you just heard, argued that the shrinkage of the number of banks and increasing consolidation of U.S. banking is moving toward a more normal, less idiosyncratic uh, banking system. And in this, uh, I'd say he is entirely correct. Dick also pointed out that 1921 was the high water mark of over 30,000 banks in the United States. Uh, I would say, Dick, we should add to that the 8,000 savings and loans there were in 1921. So altogether, we had about 38,000 depository institutions. And uh, that was with a population of about one third of what it is now in the United States. So you had nearly eight times uh, the number of institutions for a population one third as big. So you can see that the number of depository institutions per capita in those days uh, was about 23 times of what it is now. Now that's interesting to contemplate. And looking over the 100 years that Dick uh, discussed, I agree with him that one of the most important changes, and he didn't say this in his comments, but it's in his paper, that one of the most important changes during that time was the invention of the negotiable certificate of deposit uh, in the 1960s, which cleared the way for a lot of growth of banks. It was also the development of the Euro dollar market, which did the same. And then there is the movement of the whole world to pure fiat currencies in 1971, following the Nixon administration's uh, reneging on their Bretton Woods commitments and all of that allowed uh, expansion of the size of banks. Along with this went the disappearance of the of AAA rated banks. You know, there used to be a fair number in this country of banks that were rated AAA. Now uh, they all disappeared during the multiple financial crises of the 1980s. Uh, a key point uh, is that um, since the 1970s, banks have notably increased their concentration in real estate risk, speaking in generally over the system. This concentration in real estate happened both in loans, but also in their securities uh, portfolios. And it included uh, the banks basically taking over the thrift uh, industry. Now the, now the biggest banks, as Paul showed, have change that trend, but banks in general, by and large, still uh, are completely dependent on, the re on financing real estate with government guaranteed funding. Uh, finally, uh, thinking over the, the longer term, I note the disappearance of lots of formerly famous banking names. Uh, here, for example, were the 10 largest banks in the United States in order in 1976. One, the Bank of America. That is the former Bank of America in San Francisco, which no longer exists as an independent company, not the one of today. Then Citibank, Chase Manhattan, Manufacturers Hanover, Morgan Guarantee, 
Continental Illinois, Chemical Bank, Bankers Trust, First National Bank of Chicago, and Security Pacific. Now, you have to be of a certain e of a certain age to even recognize most of these names, although they were famous institutions in their days with the celebrated CEOs and the prestigious boards of directors. Of these 10, how many still exist as independent companies? The answer is two, two out of 10. And the two are Chemical Bank, which might surprise you, since it's Chemical Bank that became, it was the dominant bank that became today's JP Morgan, uh, and Citibank. And of course, Citibank, in order to survive, has been bailed out two or three times uh, in the meantime. So uh, yes, an eventful banking century. As the, as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation wrote, quote, the past 100 years of American banking have been characterized by periods of remarkably rapid change, unquote. Now, this is very true, uh, but the FDIC wrote that in 1960. So uh, it was commenting on 100 years of banking history, uh, which began in 1860. Now, this goes back. Well, that's not true. Dick, you went back to George Washington, so. I'm not getting that far. Uh, about the 1860s, I, I only want to have a short quiz uh, for the panel and the audience. You don't have to answer, just, just think about your answer. The national banking system was established by the Lincoln administration in 1863. The essence of the original national banks was to issue their own paper currency against the pledge of US treasury securities, which they bought. Now, this was a clever way to finance the government and to finance the Civil War. The quiz is, how many national banks in the original sense of the act still exist today? Now, you might guess the answer is zero, but that's not the right answer. The correct answer is 12. These 12 are the 12 Federal Reserve Banks the 12 Federal Reserve Banks do exactly what the national banks were designed to do in 1863, that is to say, issue their own currency, uh, secured by a pledge of the treasury securities that they buy in order to finance the government. By the way, you never find in Federal Reserve uh, public relations materials the fact that their principal function is really to finance the government. Of course, in another way, the Federal Reserve Banks are not like the original national banks uh, because the original national banks were prohibited from making real estate loans, which were viewed as too illiquid and risky for the issuer of currency to engage in. Well, not a bad idea, in fact. Uh, but the Federal Reserve Banks, as we know, are now huge mortgage lenders. In fact, they're $2.4 trillion of mortgage investment is bigger on an inflation adjusted basis than the entire savings and loan industry, the main mortgage lenders of their day were, uh, was uh, before its fall in the 1980s. So part of the Fed is a giant savings and loan and uh, part of it is a giant bank. And we really have to think of the Fed as part of a bigger financial institutions system that's interacting with all the other parts of it. And the same is true of uh, what I call the government mortgage complex, uh, by which I mean the combination of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae. So I believe we can expand our knowledge and our understanding of the transitions that have been going on in this very big and very interesting banking uh, industry by considering what my co-authors and I have called the banking credit system, not just the banking system, but the banking credit system. Uh, and the paper which AEI so kindly linked to the conference invitation uh, shows our look at trying to see this combination of a bigger system and how it has changed between 1970 and 2020. So you're getting today a 20 year view, as Paul said, a 100 year view, and now a 50 year view uh, but the conclusions are all consistent. 
Uh, for our 50-year view, we define the banking credit system as all the government chartered depositories plus their principal government chartered support entities. So we've got four relevant uh, components of the banking credit system. The first is the 10 biggest banks. The, the holding companies which have the 10 biggest banks. The second is all the other insured depositories. And I very much agree with Paul's approach. These two elements of the system are, are different in kind and have to be thought of differently. The, the, the few very large banks and then every, everybody else in bank. The third component is the government mortgage complex. And that means Fannie Mae plus Freddie Mac plus Ginny Mae. And the fourth component of this system uh, is composed of the Federal Reserve Banks. And, and the real banking system is all of these four components taken together uh, and interacting. The changes in this system and its components uh, over, the, over the 50 year period we're looking at with respect to asset size, the relative size of the components to each other, the share of the system, their size relative to GDP, uh, and their long-term growth rates are dramatic uh, and include remarkable expansion of the scale of the institutions involved. Uh, of course, over this period, as has been stressed by Paul and Dick, the number of insured depositories dropped a lot. Uh, in 1970, there were 19,800 depositories, that's both commercial banks and thrifts, and that dropped to 5,000 uh, in 2020, or a reduction of 75% since those bank trainee days of mine. Meanwhile, while that was going on, the huge residential mortgage sector has become dominated by the government mortgage complex, which in 1970 was relatively small, basically a rounding error in the system, but has grown very big indeed. In nominal terms, the Government mortgage complex is 260 times as big as it was in 1970. That's pretty interesting. So let's summarize the assets of the banking credit system in 2020 as I see them. The top 10 banks, $13 trillion in assets. All the others, uh, depositories together, $10 trillion. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, $6 trillion. Ginny, $2 trillion. So the government mortgage complex, $8 trillion, the Federal Reserve Bank, seven trillion, so the total banking credit system, $38 trillion, and that compares to a GDP of $21 trillion. So the system is a, a, a much bigger in asset size than the uh, annual size of the uh, economic production of the country. Now, the big winners of the share of the banking credit system over 50 years are the 10 largest banks, the government mortgage complex, and the Federal Reserve. The big losers of share are all the other depository institutions. So here's how the shares developed over the 50 years. The top 10 uh, bank holding companies went from 16% to 34% of the bank banking credit system. All the other banks went from 71% to 26. Uh, the government mortgage complex went from 3% to 22%. And the Federal Reserve Banks doubled their share from 9% to 18%. These are remarkable shifts. And uh, the, sh the shift of the total with respect to GDP uh, is also remarkable. The banking credit system doubled uh, relative to GDP, it went from 89% of GDP in 1970 to 182% uh, in 2020 or uh, doubling. In sum, the banking credit system grew substantially faster than GDP over 50 years. The Federal Reserve, now by far both the biggest bank and the biggest savings and loan of all, grew much faster than GDP. The government mortgage complex grew fastest of all at an 11.8% compound average growth rate, uh, almost double the growth rate of nominal GDP. Uh, and the banking credit system, to emphasize a point made by both 
uh, uh, Paul and Dick, uh, grew more dependent on the government, on the government, more dependent on the government mortgage complex and on the government central bank and greatly increased its dependence on explicit and implicit government guarantees. So this history once again displays Charlie's theory of political banking in action, just as Paul's numbers display it. Uh, to conclude uh, with one of my favorite quotations, this is from the economist Jacob Viner, who said, the definition of a period of transition is a period between two periods of transition. Now this is both very witty and also very true. And banking certainly has been and is, and we can confidently expect will be in successive periods of politically entwined transition. Thanks. I guess I'll take it from here. Um, thanks for inviting me, Paul. This is a pleasure to be uh, with old friends and talking about important issues. And I, I have to start with the observation that this panel is uh, all too rare uh, in our current discourse about banking. Banking discussions and the press are not doing their jobs on this are dominated by what who I'll call the apologists for the status quo basically Federal Reserve officials and bank CEOs who are getting huge amount of attention. And if you would read uh, most of the major newspapers, you really wouldn't have a sense that there's anything wrong in the current arrangement in the banking system um, or anything strange about it. Uh, and I think that that's a great disservice to the country because I feel like there's a lot wrong um, and so I'm going to be uh, building on what my three friends, uh, predecessors in the panel have already talked about, but with a little bit more of a pointed approach to talking about what's wrong, to thinking a little bit about the future. Um, Dick Silla asked, is the banking industry in decline? Clearly it is in, in terms of economic performance, but if you're protected by the government, economic performance doesn't actually lead you to exit. <laughs> poor economic performance, and that's a problem. So I'm gonna be talking about that and with a, a mind toward thinking about what is the FinTech future of the banking system and how will that be conditioned by the, the, the trends and the politics that have defined the current arrangement. So let me start by characterizing the current status quo. I wanna characterize it as a three-legged stool. And here you'll see I'm building on my predecessors in the panel. A three-legged stool, what are the three legs of the stool? One, extreme consolidation. Uh, Alex just reminded us between the top 10 banks, the mortgage complex and the Federal Reserve banks, how consolidated the credit system is. Secondly, extreme dependency, by which I mean dependency on government guarantees and protection dependency that's exemplified by the following elements. Deposit insurance that is essentially 100% now in the banking system. Uh, Title II of Dodd-Frank basically codifying the future bailouts of any large too big to fail banks. The expansion of the Federal Reserve's role, notwithstanding the Dodd-Frank rollback of the Federal Reserve, that's illusory since 2008, the Fed is taken on an extremely aggressive role with its lender of last resort abilities uh, now to be performing even rescues of the municipal bond market before it's even in crisis. And Fannie and Freddie and Ginny May, of course, government guaranteed mortgage complex writ uh, very large. So the second leg of the stool is dependency. Remember the first leg is consolidation. The third leg, is real estate lending. And uh, Alex Pollack I was talking about that. One of my favorite Alex Pollack quotes is that uh, we call these commercial banks, our chartered banks, but more if we were more honest, we'd call them real estate banks. Um, so if, if you were a banker a hundred years ago and, and you somehow came to life right now, you'd have a heart attack 
if you looked at the balance sheets of our commercial banks today, and you'd realize that 75% of their loans are collateralized by real estate. Now, a uh, hundred years ago, that number wouldn't have even been 10%. Uh, it was considered unsafe. Uh, real estate is very illiquid. It tends to be very correlated with the business cycle. And so a bank can't operate safely with anything like uh, a 75% real estate share. And of course, that is uh, a, a really a, an amazing change. So here are the three legs of the stool, consolidation, dependency, and real estate lending. Now, as Alex already pointed out, I tend to like to think whenever you look at an equilibrium of the banking system, that particular three-legged stool, what you're really seeing is in, in the background, some sort of political bargain that gave rise to that three-legged stool. What is that political bargain? It's a deal between these very large consolidated intermediaries and the politicians who run the government. And that deal works for them basically to channel subsidies without them being on the budget of the national government, without being actually part of our budgetary process, to channel subsidies through the financial system and to use the banks as that conduit for those subsidies. And so now let's look at each of the three elements of the stool from that perspective. First, consolidation. Well, it, consolidation makes control much easier because you only have a handful of institutions to control. <laughs> we control them directly. The top 10 banks, of course, extremely controlled. Uh, but then also Fannie and Freddie are still in uh, conservatorship. So control is a big part of consolidation. Also some creation of monopoly rents through consolidation uh, as part of the compensation for all the regulation. The second part of the compensation for the regulation is the second uh, leg of the stool dependency because protection, dependency gives protection. Banks and other of these lenders are protected from failure and they're protected from competition. Notice there are no new entrants in the banking system. None, none since the financial crisis. There is no competition faced by these very large institutions. And they come to lecture at my classes at Columbia and the, the honest ones among them basically point out that their business plan is largely based on regulatory barriers to competition, which they take advantage of. So of course, Dependency and consolidation are all about the deal between the protected institutions and their political masters. The third part is real estate lending. Again, not surprising, this is a very politically popular use of the banking system as an off budget channel for subsidies. Unfortunately, subsidies that can only be delivered though through excessive le leverage and encouragement for excessive risk taking because the way you get a subsidy is more debt. And that's why we're the unique country in the world that thinks a 3% down payment on a home is safe and sound. Of course, that's Looney Tunes. But that is a political reality that comes from this deal. Now the trends I'm talking about actually are global. The US is just an extreme case. And what they've led to is a tolerance for fragility and inefficiency uh, fragility coming from that real estate exposure and from a non-robust prudential regulatory system. I won't have time to talk about that, but I'm happy. I welcome questions about how I know the banking system in particular, the, its prudential structure is not robust. So fragility and inefficiency, very low profitability for U.S. banks. Look at the market to book ratio. So the market ratio tells you the economic value of the enterprise. The book ratio just tells you the tangible assets value. What you'll see is, for example, Citigroup, one of the largest institutions in the world, has a market to book ratio substantially below one. That means that Citibank is in the business of destroying value because the value of its enterprise is less than the value of its tangible asset. It is a value destroyer par excellence. But only very few banks are maintaining uh, significantly above their book value and market value. So the banking system, yes, Dick, it's in decline. And of course, part of the problem they're facing is in this low interest environment, the whole business line of 
uh, collecting core deposits is unprofitable. The physical costs of maintaining a branch network are far in excess of the gains that banks get from having them. The whole branch network of US banks on a forward looking basis should be shut down. If you looked at, uh, if, if the banks were going to make a decision based on the profitability for the foreseeable future of having that network because branches are deposit taking uh, vehicles. That's what they are. So yes, uh, it's a very inefficient system. It survives because it's a political deal of that three-legged stool of consolidation, dependency, and real estate funding. What about the fintech future? What's going on? Well, first of all, the future of banking is very different from this uh, sclerotic uh, status quo. The future is unbundling, first of all. That means most of the new technologies are about doing lending as a separate business or doing payments transfers, not combining them in the traditional way. And I think that actually makes sense economically as somebody who's argued in the, in the past that there were good economic reasons for that uh, combining of those two. I now believe they're good economic reasons explaining the decline. And so what we're seeing is unbundled shadow banks growing dramatically in their market share and exhibiting much higher market to book ratios, much greater profitability new payment system platforms that are very different from the backward Fed dominated and bank, large bank dominated system, which is essentially a holdover from the 19th century. This is that's really not changed much in the last hundred years, remarkably. And of course, these new payments platforms are much better and a blockchain decentralized payment system is more robust, more efficient, faster, uh, has the cap capacity to do additional things uh, just obviously much better. And on the lending side, we're seeing the new technologies able to reduce information costs and physical costs. And really interesting, not only be more efficient, but also much more inclusive because we still have 20% of our households in America that are unbanked or underbanked. And FinTech is the promise for fixing that problem. Now, one of the things that when I was at the OCC, I was very happy about is that we, we were very aggressive and still are, I think, over there about wanting to charter these new fintech firms. Um, from their standpoint, what do they have to gain from it? Well, a few things. First of all, a national platform rather than a state platform. Secondly, the credibility that comes from the examination process of the OCC, which is really the jewel of the OCC throughout its history, being able to, for example, for a crypto provider, being able to make it clear how their algorithms work, whether they're honest, whether they actually maintain the reserve assets that they say they maintain, all the rest of that. And of course, especially if you're a fintech firm that doesn't rely on deposits. And I want to emphasize the, the fintech firms of the future, even the ones involved in payments, can execute that without deposits. Stable value crypto coins do not need to become deposits. What does that mean? It means if you're not issuing deposits, you're not subject to FDIC regulation. You're not subject to the Fed's bank holding company oversight. You're not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act, at least currently. And what that means is you get a lot of the benefits of the charter without the huge cost. Wow, this is a great idea. Uh, it can bring life into our banking system and create a future that we all would, would love to welcome. What's the problem? How do you fit that into the existing political equilibrium that I described in the three-legged stool? Very hard. The politicians never sleep. They notice the FinTech threat, as do the big banks, as does the Fed, as does the NCRC. All see that their, their um, alliance, their coalition, based on this delivery of subsidies through the existing status quo is under threat. And so of course, they're already hard at work trying to figure out how to create new obligations, new kinds of taxes effectively, regulatory taxes on these would be FinTech firms that might wanna get chartered. And so the big policy question is, is if you're uh, one of the FinTech firms, do you wanna get a charter subjecting yourself to all of the risk that people like Maxine Waters are going to come up with great new ideas for how to extract a pound of flesh from you 
or do you want to stay out of it and stay in the shadows where you currently operate, but without the advantages of the charter? Um, how will all this evolve? Uh, my advice to the fintech firms is stay in the shadows for now until we have policymakers in Washington who are willing to actually articulate a new political bargain that can give us a viable, sound, chartered banking system that's not sitting on this three-legged stool. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Bert. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, have some slides that I'm going to click through. Uh, so should I proceed, Paul? Okay. Um, all right. Do, do we do we see my slides here? There we go. Let me uh, back up to the uh, to the to the first slide. And um, bear with me just a minute. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to to be here today, Paul, and to participate uh, in this uh, discussion. Uh, it, before I get started going through my slides, let me just mention that I think the paper that uh, uh, you wrote uh, has lots of tables, lots of charts, and so forth, but really excellent piece of work in terms of trying to uh, convey uh, where we uh, where we are today and, and, and where we've been. And I. I uh, highly commended to the, the viewers uh, of this uh, this webinar. Um, to uh, to begin, uh, the thing that uh, uh, I think a key conclusion that uh, Paul has um, noted, and that is that uh, the larger banks are are less active than than they have been in the past as uh, lenders to the private sector, but that that may not be true for uh, all depository institutions. The smaller institutions, if you will are more like uh, uh, banks as we th th thought of them uh, 20 or 30 or 40 uh, years ago. Uh, and I think that's, a, Paul has some very important uh, uh, detail in, in that regard. Uh, the second thing that uh, uh, is, is interesting is the extent to which um, the banking system as a whole has become uh, increasingly a funder of uh, the federal government. Uh, not only in terms of the Treasury Department, but also of uh, the government-sponsored uh, uh, enterprises, and uh, we note that particularly in the in, in the data that loans actually uh, increased uh, less from over the last three years than uh, were the uh, banking system's holdings of of Treasury and GSE debt uh, uh, securities. You know, loans up 156 billion and. Uh, 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 Treasury and uh, GS Treasury Securities and GSE debt uh, held by the uh, uh, the country's banks by about one and a third trillion dollars. So it's a really significant shift uh, by the banking system towards funding uh, the, the federal government and the and the GSEs. Um, but it's also interesting is that uh, the depository institutions, uh, which is the banks. The thrifts and the credit unions are increasingly uh, intermediating, depo inter interme intermediating deposits through the Fed into uh, the Treasury and other debt. And what I find particularly interesting is that just last year, uh, the reserves that uh, the banks had on deposit at the Fed nearly doubled to $3 trillion. This is $3 trillion coming out of the banking system going into the Fed, which the Fed then uses to buy uh, treasuries and uh, governments uh, and the issuances of the government sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and, and the federal home bank, federal home loan banks. Uh, now, uh, I have a, a little chart here just to illustrate how, how, how this uh, 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 works, is that, uh, you know, the banks uh, put on deposit at the Fed a portion of their of their customer deposits, uh, not just to meet reserve requirements, but uh, because uh, that's where in effect they park excess funds and earn interest uh, paid by, by the Fed. And then what the uh, uh, Fed does is basically take those reserves uh, and uh, which are a liability of the Fed and buy uh, uh, treasury uh, securities and then um, 
the treasury issues those securities, which in effect are paying, are helping or financing the uh, huge deficit that the federal government is, is running right now. Now, to me, a, a danger here that I don't think is uh, uh, sufficiently well recognized, and that is that uh, the, the federal government uh, through the Fed uh, has financed about one fifth over $4 trillion of uh, the, the uh, total debt issued uh, by, by the treasury. So the federal government has become increasingly dependent upon the banking system uh, to finance uh, the growing deficit we have uh, in the country and to the extent that uh, concerns get raised about the credit worthiness of the federal government, those concerns obviously would then spill over uh, to, to the banking uh, system. Um, but what also is something that is not, uh, I don't think uh, very few people understand, and that is that the treasury uh, securities that uh, the Fed is, is holding essentially are funded by very short-term uh, bank deposits. So there's a very serious maturity mismatch, if you will, between uh, the uh, treasury debt that's outstanding, which has, tends to be of medium and long-term versus uh, the very short-term nature of uh, uh, bank deposits as they're now structured uh, today. In terms of uh, changes in the industry that, uh, that need to be viewed, um, uh, banks and other depository institutions, which again includes uh, the credit unions, today only hold about one fifth of the assets of the, of the financial sector. In other words, the US economy is largely financed outside of uh, the, the banking uh, system. Um, and uh, what that means is that uh, events that happen outside of, of the banking system can negatively impact uh, banks and other depository institutions. And I would say that the 2008 financial crisis and its aftermath uh, are very much evidence of that phenomena. In other words, a lot of the problems that the banking system had after 2008 erupted outside of the, uh, the banking system and then spilled over uh, in, into the banking system, causing among other things, several hundred bank failures. Now, uh, I think this is, uh, I think pretty clear to everybody who's uh, uh, studying the financial system. And that is that we seem to be going through uh, what I consider to be a sustained period of financial disruption. The pandemic is certainly having an impact all the technical innovations, uh, such as those that uh, Charlie spoke about, and importantly, the sustained period of very low interest rates, which is doing a lot to undermine the basic economics of the, uh, of the banking uh, business. But the other thing that I find most interesting just in recent months, and that is the, uh, uh, the recent frauds and risk management failures that have taken place uh, not just the United States, but uh, also outside uh, the United States. And I'll just, I list just a few of these. Uh, uh, Wirecard, which was a, uh, basically a, a German uh, credit card uh, processor. Uh, Archegos, which was uh, operating with, uh, uh, trying to capitalize on so-called total return swaps. Uh, Greensill, which was uh, basically, uh, providing supply chain financing, and that has turned into a real finance fiasco. Um, there, you had the Malaysian Development Bank where essentially there was a huge uh, uh, defalcation uh, facilitated in part through the New York Federal Reserve Bank. And even in a country like Mozambique, a $2 billion uh, uh, scandal involving a, a, a tuna bond. So what we're seeing is, um, uh, uh, some very significant uh, uh, frauds and, 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 and failures that are occurring on a, a global basis uh, throughout the, uh, the financial system. So far, and I emphasize so far, uh, no large banks have, uh, have failed from these and other uh, recent banking blunders and frauds, but uh, you know, there's something that could possibly happen. And it is interesting uh, the extent to which some of the large Swiss banks, uh, Credit Suisse being a very good example, are reporting tremendous uh, losses and having to suspend dividends and stock buybacks and so forth. And so to me, an interesting question right now is, uh, 
what other shoes are going to be dropping in, in, in the coming months during this time of pandemics, financial disruption due to technology changes, and these very low uh, interest rates. To, to uh, wrap up, the thing that uh, strikes me as I, I look at all of the, the problems that are going on, and that is that uh, is the importance of credit risk and, and the significance it plays in causing uh, 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 bank failures and other distress in the, uh, in the financial system. And so that, uh, and I think this has always been the case and will always continue to be the case. And that is uh, properly assessing uh, uh, credit risk. It's, it's essential to, uh, to banking's uh, survival. And uh, while technology such as what Charlie has, uh, was just talking about has uh, uh, provided the tools that allows for the better assessment of risk, those tools are also have been and uh, continue to be used to facilitate new forms of risk taking. And that's kind of a balancing question. On the, on the one hand, uh, it's easier uh, to assess risk, but on the other hand, it's easier to, uh, to take risk. Um, but uh, another uh, important factor that, that I touched on before, and that is a sustained period of, of low interest rates. It's squeezing uh, net interest margins uh, being earned by the banks. And the squeeze on those margins, uh, among other things, is reducing the, the cushion that banks and other lenders have to absorb credit risk. And of course, one of the ways that uh, banks are trying to deal with this is by closing branches and trying to reduce operating expenses to live uh, with these uh, uh, exceptionally low uh, interest rates and, and low net interest margins. So uh, there's a there's kind of a race uh, uh, underway right now in terms of uh, can can expenses and losses be reduced as fast as uh, net interest margins are, are declining. And so this is why again, we'll come back to the issue of properly pricing a, a, a credit risk. In my opinion, it has become uh, increasingly important uh, uh, to banking, and this is going to be a, a major challenge in, in, in the coming years, is in effect doing a better job of what banks have always supposed to have been able to do, and that is to assess and properly price uh, uh, credit risk. And with that, uh, I welcome any, any, any questions on our continued discussion, and thank you. So um, I need to now blow out of this yeah, please. Okay, which I will, I have to uh, find that particular button here. There you go. Okay, there we go. Now we're out. Back, back to Bert. Thank you. Thank you all very much for uh, wonderful, wonderful discussions. Very interesting there. And um, now, now, uh, now, now it's my job to try to stimulate a little discussion uh, amongst us here. Um, one of, one of the things that uh, Dick, I think you noted, and Charlie came back, and, and certainly uh, Alex uh, emphasized too, was the, the fact that you know, the number of institutions are declining. There's consolidation. Uh, uh, both Charlie and Dick brought up the, you know, is the banking industry you know, a, a declining industry? Now, if you look, uh, and Charlie touched on this a little, but if you actually look at return on assets in the banking system, um, Return on assets have dropped over the last 20 years. You know, from a from a little above 10 percent uh, to to a little below 10 percent uh, re return on their total assets, and even even maintaining uh, the levels that they've had. The way they've done it is interest in, their interest expense has really um, declined to the extent that it's really not the most important expense that that banks face. Uh, it's more uh, staffing and, and other things, overhead. Uh, so, it, you know, because we're, we're in a zero interest rate environment, uh, banks don't have to pay a lot to raise funding. They raise 80% of their funding with deposits. Uh, they, they don't pay very much for it. They actually earn fees on them. And so, so what happens when the Fed finally has to raise uh, short-term interest rates and deposit rates go up? So we've got these squeezed interest margins. You've got banks all banks basically funding themselves 80% uh, with, with deposits and deposit rates, of course, react um, uh, 
you know, are going to react uh, quite quickly to if the Fed raises the, the rate it pays on uh, reserves to, to, to raise the short term interest rate. So so what happens to the banking system uh, uh, when when this finally happens, when we finally have to raise rates? I think, Paul, that's a great question. And the, the extended period, far, uh, far greater in extent than anybody thought. 10 years ago, looking forward, that very low interest rates could last, let alone negative interest rates, which were claimed to be impossible, uh, but weren't, uh, is a dominant theme, not only in banking, but the whole financial system. What happens to the whole financial system uh, if interest rates go anything like normal or even just up uh, one or two percent uh, has to be uh, has to be a huge question. and. Uh, uh, and since, from the central banker's point of view, the, all of the debt outstanding will be seriously damaged by uh, raising interest rates, they don't want to do that, including all the debt on the central bank's own balance sheet, that you're really in a kind of, uh, of trap that the low interest rates encourage the debt and the high, le high debt levels uh, encourage uh, keeping interest rates low. Uh, but they won't stay low forever. They will go back up. Uh, and then what for banks, as you say, but also for the, uh, for the entire uh, financial system? I just want to add, add to that. I think that your, your, your question has different pieces, Paul. Obviously, one piece is, well, when interest rates go up, that will make the business of uh, collecting core deposits may be more profitable again, but it's also going to have a lot of other uh, negative effects. One of the things, as somebody who grew up, grew up in a real estate business family, one of the things that's been striking to me is, and I'm not talking about long ago, let's say the 1990s, it was hard to get a commercial real estate loan that had more than a seven year maturity and more than a 15 year amortization. Now, it's easy to get one that might be a 25 year amortization and a 10 or 15 year maturity. So as, we, and we've seen just a lot of locking in, the commercial banks now have a very large, because they're doing a lot of commercial real estate investing, let's note that the maturity and the amortization schedules on commercial real estate loans have become extremely expanded over the last decade. So that's another, a piece of this that needs to be thought about. Uh, Paul, if I could just jump in on this. I, Charlie, following up on what Charlie has said, there is an enormous amount of interest rate mismatching in bank balance sheets. If you take a look at where the types of deposits, they're, uh, they're, you know, they're basically read, readily withdrawable uh, accounts. Uh, and, and not even, uh, or very short-term CDs. And so one of the things that concerns me is we are in a situation that has some troubling parallels with the early 80s when the SNLs got into trouble with, as rates rose on deposits uh, at a much faster clip uh, than it did on the fixed rate uh, home mortgages they had on their books. So, uh, I, and I feel that that maturity mismatching is something that's not getting the attention that, uh, today that it should. No, Bert, um, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to come to you with that question. Does this look like we've created another SNL problem here? Dick? Well, I, I think the what I'm taking away from the, the, the discussion is, is the, the big change in how our banking system has become a sort of real estate uh, <laughs> lending industry. And uh, having studied, uh, you know, long-term banking developments and also banking uh theory, history. I, I was reminded of, uh, there was an Englishman who was a deputy governor of the Bank of England. And when Walter Badgett wrote Lombard Street, he was kind of arguing with this fellow. The man's name was Thompson Hankey. And he was a British businessman, but he was also a you know, governor of the Bank of England. And he wrote a book called Principles of Banking. And one of Thompson Hankey's uh, principles was it a banker needs to know the difference he said between um, a promissory note and a mortgage his <laughs> be, his business deals with the former <laughs> in other words 
the old banking ortho, and we referred to this several times. I think when you have, we have what seventy five percent of the banks' uh, assets are in real estate lending now, or at least the the, the banks other than the very largest. And um, uh, it was ten percent earlier in the century. I think you said that, Charlie. Uh, and the National Banking Act didn't allow American banks to lend on real estate. I think Alexander Hamilton's charter for the bank in the United States said it, it could only own its own banking house. And, you know, if people defaulted on loans it made, it might you know, take real estate collateral. But the, the idea that banks would be so heavily involved in real estate, which is typically longer term lending, we're talking about maturity mismatch. Uh, Thompson Hankey would have been aghast, you know, in 19th century bankers, maybe even early 20th century bankers would have been aghast that we've turned our banking or our bank credit system, as Alex calls it, uh, into a sort of real estate uh, business. Uh, just a little side note on Thompson Hankey. Um, of course, Walter Badgett argued with him uh, long ago. But last year, it was discovered that Thompson Hankey actually owned four plantations in Grenada and had 500 slaves. And so now they've taken his picture out of the Bank of England. You know, he's, he's been sort of set, <laughs> set, semi canceled, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he was luckier than American slaveholders because when the British abolished slavery in the 1830s, uh, they had a 20 uh, million pound payment to the slave owners as compensation. And uh, I discovered that Thompson Hankey actually uh, uh, was given 20,000 pounds, no, 20,000. Uh, 15,000 pounds or something like $75,000 uh, to free his 500 slaves. But, uh, you know, history caught up with him and, and now they've taken this picture out of the Bank of England and the Bank of England has apologized for having had such a person uh, in, in their uh, top, top leadership. <laughs> do, do you think Dick, we might say, what would Thompson Hankey have thought of the central bank? That, that is to say the Federal Reserve. Well, you know, point four trillion dollars of mortgages on its books. I'm sure when, he'd be truly against. Yeah, he would have been against that. And also, you know, I mean, uh, Walter Badgett was the fellow supposedly giving credit for, you know, Badgett's rules of what the ba uh, central bank should do in a crisis, basically lender of last resort. And Thompson Hankey pronounced the Badgett's lender of last resort ideas to be the most pernicious uh, ideas on banking he'd ever encountered. <laughs> I, I want to build on what Dix just said by reminding everyone how this happened over time, how banks got involved in real estate. And I want to emphasize the connection between government protection and the political deal that led to real estate. So first of all, when did national banks change their rule of a zero tolerance for real estate? And the answer is 1913. And those of you who know a little history will know that that was part of the Federal Reserve Act, that the Federal Reserve Act changed that as part of the political deal to attract initially agricultural landowners to support the Federal Reserve Act. Then in the 20s and the 30s and subsequently, uh, things were expanded. The Federal Thrift Charter was created with deposit insurance of thrifts to support real estate in the 1930s. So was Fannie Mae created in the 1930s for exactly that purpose. It was a political choice to create short-term funds through thrifts to support real estate. That was the federal charter and that was fizzling. And then it, uh, Sophia Chen and I have a paper coming out in the Journal of Financial Intermediation where we found that expansions in the generosity of deposit insurance around the world have produced major increases in commercial banks' holdings of real estate-backed loans. So that this isn't just a US phenomenon. And it, 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 it's hard to know which of two stories to tell. I think they're, they're not mutually exclusive. One is if you have deposit insurance, you can tolerate the liquidity risk because your depositors aren't going to withdraw from you if they're insured as a result of a real estate cycle. The second thing is you give deposit insurance to a bank in exchange for the political favor of making more of these politically popular mortgages. So I, I think this has really been a long-term evolution. And now we're sort of like the frog in the pot who now realizes the pot, the water is boiling. How did we get here? We got here the dishonest way through political deal-making for the last century.
Um, if, if I could just add another historical note there, um, one of the, the drivers of uh, the pressure to provide bank financing for uh, 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 farm real estate was World War I, because what happened is that you had increased demand for crops, farmland prices were rising at that time, and not only were banks empowered to uh, make real estate loans, but that's when the first government-sponsored enterprise was created. The the uh, the federal uh, farm credit banks are now the farm credit system was again created to provide a, another source of financing for uh, rapidly rising uh, prices of farmland. I want to come okay. back to the question of the interest rate risk mismatch uh, involved in all this. The biggest interest rate mismatch of all is the one on the books of the Federal Reserve. Because the mortgages they own are 30 year, just like you're talking about the savings and loans, 30 year fixed rate mortgages. They also have a huge portfolio of very long treasury bonds. Um, now, it's a little bit different if you're a fiat currency central bank, but there's no hedging there on the books of the Fed. It's all just a naked, long interest rate risk. So, I, I, well taken, and I think you mentioned- I don't know where that goes, but it's interesting. You, 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 you mentioned in your remark, the Federal Reserve is now the biggest SNL of all time. And <laughs> I think that's factually correct. Yeah. Um, we have so much knowledge here though. So if, if, we, if we went back in time uh, when we had, and still we still have private banks in Switzerland, I think, and back in the old days when we had banks, what, what, what ratio of deposits to assets would typically have been, uh, you know, appropriate for, uh, you know, for a well-run bank without government support. Now we're at 80% across the board, which strikes me as just amazingly large uh, historically. What, what kind of historical numbers would we have expected to see? Um, does anybody have a view on that or remember some examples from the past? What would that Paul, number look like without government? Well, Paul, wouldn't that depend a lot on the nature of, of the bank assets that are being funded uh, in terms of whether there's just short-term loans or, uh, as we now see today, uh, a lot of uh, longer-term real estate lending? Sure. Um, I, I guess it would. Um, but, I mean, 80% of your funding is is can be removed on demand. Is uh, could, could that exist without a government guarantee? I mean, no, no, uh -uh. absolutely not. not. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll turn to a, another question here. So 20, 20 some odd years ago, um, I joined the uh, International Monetary Fund as a, as a deputy director in the banking division. And what my first mission for the IMF was, they sent me to Argentina. And this was before Argentina before it blew up the first time. They, uh, I had just come from Freddie Mac and they wanted somebody to look at the banking system and look at securitization and they figured this guy's- Wait a minute, Argentina blew up the first time in 1825. Oh. So we're not gonna blame that one on you. Well, the, the, the last time it blew up in the last century, 1999 or eight or something like that. But they flew us all in and, um, and they wanted me to look at securitization in the banking industry. And then what was striking at the time was the, you know, they had the fixed exchange rate problem and everybody knew that, and, but you weren't allowed to talk about that. Uh, you know, their, their problem with the, you know, wrong exchange rate they, and they, they couldn't, couldn't say they were going to devalue. But the banking system had, by any measure at the time, a lot of regulatory capital. And they also had 30% of their assets invested in government securities. So everybody assumed they must be safe because, you know, those securities have a zero risk weight. But of course, as soon as, as soon as the, they couldn't hold the exchange rate and they started burning tires in the streets, uh, you know, all the banks failed. Uh, well, I was working in Argentina around that same time. And one of the things that you saw happening in Argentina as the crisis war on and as the government found that it couldn't sell its bonds in the international market anymore. It sold them to the banks. It didn't, yes, it sold them to the banks and the pension funds, yeah. but not through voluntary purchase, through mandated purchase. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, you're the regulator. What we see, and we've seen this in lots of countries, regulators, and this is, I, I, if I can abuse the privilege, 
I call this the Calamere's first law of banking, which is banks won't, able, won't be able to do anything other than uh, ensure the sovereign's solvency until the sovereign solvency is insured. And that's the history of the Bank of England, of course, until 1815. And it's also when, when Argentina got into trouble, the banks and the pensions were stuffed with government debt as a way to avoid the inevitable, which happened uh, later and then brought with it, not just the uh, default of the government, but then the insolvency of the banking system. I, can, can, can I suggest that uh, we're kind of headed in that direction in, uh, in this country today with uh, roughly one fifth of uh, the treasury debt now held directly or indirectly by the banking system, not only through the treasury securities they have in their balance sheet, but on the huge amount that they've deposited at the Federal Reserve, which has turned right around and bought uh, Treasury security. So there's a slippery slope there. And uh, we may, may not be too far down the slope, but we're certainly heading down the slope. I, I agree with you. Let, let me also point out, and I think it's a great uh, credit to Larry Summers, that he's made himself so unpopular among Democrats by pointing out the very great inflation risk that we're currently facing. And I think that uh, we really are looking, uh, it's amazing to me how people forget things so quickly. And now we have this new monetary theory, ridiculous thing, which is neither new nor monetary nor a theory that just says, well, inflation doesn't seem, we've, we've had enough years where inflation's low that we believe we don't need to worry about it. That's not a very <laughs> good theory, right? And um, what's happened is for the last generation, of course, real interest rates have fallen dramatically too. Um, we don't really know why that happened. It's a global phenomenon, but it, I think it's very likely to reverse itself. I believe it's a, it's a demographic savings story globally that isn't going to be permanent. So the combination of the inflation risks and the real interest rate risk make me think that before we're dead, that is the group on this panel, myself and <laughs> well, we're all dead. We're going to see a rise of inflation. That's called a dangerous thing for an economist to do, make a forecast with a limited time horizon. But I think it's true. It's not a 50 year from now story. Uh, it's, it's more like a 10 year from now story. Well, if I could just interject again a little bit of uh, history that we'll all remember, and that was what happened in the early 80s when uh, we had uh, a very sharp uh, increase in nominal interest rates in the early 80s. And what did that do? Within a couple of years, it tanked the uh, SNL industry and, uh, you know, things just went, uh, went downhill from, uh, from there. And that's what really concerns me about the extent to which uh, short-term bank deposits, uh, some bearing no interest uh, cost at all, are funding, uh, you know, now a fifth of, uh, of the outstanding uh, federal debt. So I want to, I want to switch gears just a little bit here and, and go back to the statement that, um, you know, maybe the banking system's in decline, maybe maybe, uh, maybe its importance in the economy is shrinking a little bit. And let's, I want to, I want to look at that from perhaps the bright side of things. Okay, so if the if the banking system used to fund 19% basically of credit in the country and now it's dropped to about a little over 18%, but the banking system has this. Uh, inherently um, uh, gotcha political deal with the government that, you know, it exists and is protected, but the government, uh, you know, extracts its pound of flesh from the banking system to protect them. And you've got to, you've got to subsidize what the politicians want you to subsidize. So if the banking system is shrinking, uh, is, the, is the rest of, of the financial system less subject to this uh, government grab? And, and so, you know, can the government, you know, kill this goose that, that it's using to, you know, lay golden eggs uh, that, that aren't on the budget? Um, you know, or, or will they start imposing things like CR, CRA on uh, mortgage originators that aren't banks or things like that? How, uh, you know, w w what's the path to the future? If, if we start choking the banks off, do the, does the government expand its reach and and grab for other intermediaries. Um, well, I think we could say the banking system is not shrinking relative to the size of the economy. We saw that in, in your numbers and in, and in mine. Uh, 
uh, banking assets are bigger relative to GDP, but the whole financial system is, a lot, is a lot bigger still. And we get what my friend David Levy calls the big balance sheet economy, which is that the stocks of financial assets and liabilities get bigger and bigger relative to the underlying uh, flow of real activity. Uh, and that brings us back to uh, where that may end with, with rising nominal and real interest rates and and inflation. I completely agree with uh, Charlie's point there, except my timeline would be much shorter. I, I think it's nearly upon us, uh, Charlie. Oh, I guess. I, I, I didn't mean to say it's 10 years away. I said within the next 10. Um, I, but, you know, Alex, even though it's true that the banking system has been growing, if you just look at the last seven years, um, it's, the shadow banks are really in, in substantially increasing their market share, both in payment system and in credit. Um, I think that Paul's question, though, is can the government shut that down? And the sure. answer is yes. Now, I mean, stable value coins last year grew by tenfold in their total size. But with if, if, you can, if you have a Congress and administration that wants to stop them, they can stop them. Or wants to add regulatory burdens to them, they can do so. And to preserve their sclerotic status quo, they very much might be willing to. Uh, so I think this is the big un unknown question going forward. Will the government decide not only to uh, cripple its chartered banking system, but to cripple the entire financial system in the interest of creating this monopoly, monopolized three-legged stool platform for political subsidies? Or will they allow the shadow system to continue to be the bright spot for efficiency and for financial inclusion? And I can tell you that uh, where I, I, I can't talk about things at the OCC, uh, except to say that uh, I saw both, I, I could tell both stories based on my uh, uh, time at the OCC. The, the politicians clearly wanna shut down the ones who, who see the importance of this status quo, clearly wanna shut down the progressive uh, shadow banking uh, system or attach a pound of flesh tax to it. Whether they will succeed is a political forecast it depends on who we elect. Charlie. Also, I jump in there with one other comment, which is Charlie is raising the question, as he did in his comments, of entry, of entry into banking uh, explicitly. And another interesting case of that is what happens in a crisis. Uh, we, Paul's number showed a very small number of new banks and zero uh, in the crisis. Now, what should happen in a crisis is you should have a lot of new entry with new capacity and new capital coming in. What happens is in order to protect its existing uh, guarantees uh, and the, the deposit insurance fund, the regulators shut down new entry in the time of the crisis, just when you should be most encouraging new entry and new capital, the, uh, uh, the new entry is shut down in order to try to finance the legacy losses that have already occurred in the old system. So I think we could take as one of the themes that we ought to have is an encouragement of new entry all the time. Dick pointed out the 30s, the 1930s uh, solution to banking was to create a nationwide cartel of banks presided over by the regulators. And part of that was strict, uh, strict uh, uh, controls limiting new entry very, very much. I can remember days when, when they had to go down to Washington to open a new branch, in, at least in the thrifts, you had to get the Federal Home Loan Bank Board of uh, Dishonored Memory to approve some new branch. Well, that leads to a, a non-responsive, non-competitive situation. We, we need somehow to move to a situation where, where we recognize this game that goes on between the managers of the monopoly or the cartel uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and the new entrants cutting them out and instead get to a point where, we, where we're encouraging new entry at all times, but especially when we're in trouble is when the new entry is most helpful. Uh, Dick, Dick, can I go, go to Dick for a second? So Dick, in that 50 year period between you know, 1934 when Rose, you know, we had the creation of the FDIC and all the, that stuff and, 
the 50 year period, we had stability. We had, um, you know, the government, no, the banks didn't fail. The, the, the government banking deal then, did the government extract their pound of flesh from the banks like they have in the last, learned to do in the last 40 or 50 years? Was that period, did, did, did they have all these, you know, well, I, it's not, it wasn't like today because, the, you know, apart from World War II, I mean, the banks loaded up on government debt in World War II. But then after the war, the banks actually sold off a lot of their government debt. And I, I think people at Citibank called it getting back into the business of banking. You know, they said the, the job of banks wasn't really to hold a lot of government debt. The business of banking was lending to the private sector. I think what we heard today was, gee, you know, the, the banks are getting back in the business of lending a lot to the, the government. Uh, um, but I think, you know, they charge people for banks, uh, you know, the insurance fees for the, but for very few banks failed. So they kept the, the, the insurance costs very low. I, I don't think there was a, a lot of extraction, uh, 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 you know, a value, I mean, from banks. Uh, um, I did know on the, on this issue of, um, uh, how will we deal with fintech? I mean, I, I happened to read Jamie Dimon's letter to shareholders over the weekend. And of course, he, he was saying that the banks are very heavily regulated and it's sort of unfair that the uh, fintech guys aren't regulated as much as banks. Now, there are two conclusions you can draw from that. One is that Jamie Dimon wants the banks to be regulated less, but it could also be that he would like to get fintech to be regulated more. And on this uh, sort of bank bargains thing, I, I, I would tend to think that... Uh, um, I always thought when 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 the you know digital uh, what do you call them cryptocurrencies came along that if there was something really to the innovation that the you know the central banks would get in the business of doing it themselves and and so so I sort of think the you know the I would lay my money on the fact that the uh, the, the the bank bargain people in Washington will probably crack down on fintech rather than uh, deregulating uh, the banking system we have now. But there, there is a, I mean, you might call it a regulatory mismatch between the banking system and, and the, the fintech. And uh, uh, let me make one other point too on this outlook for inflation. I mean, it, it seems to me that we might be having inflation in the form of rising asset prices now. And I worry about that because one of the great mistakes you see repeated over and over in banking history is when some assets go up in value, let's say stocks and uh, bonds. And, and right now, real estate houses, you know, the Wall Street Journal over the weekend had you know, rising house prices. I mean, here in New Hampshire, where I am, I think the, the gain in the past year has been like 20 plus percent in house values. And uh, what you see over and over in financial history is when assets rise in value, they become collateral for larger and larger loans. Uh, or people can extract the value. And what, I'm a little worried right now that we, we are having asset price inflation, houses and stocks, and, and this is going to say, well, I, I have a lot more wealth now so I can borrow more from my bank. And this is one way financial systems get into trouble. So I would uh, endorse Alex's view, Charlie, that we may not have to wait uh, to our last years to see uh, some trouble on this front. <laughs> I agree with you. By the way, you brought up JP Morgan. I'd just like to say they're clearly the best bank in the world in terms of how they're managed and how much value they create. They've been pioneering a new project to bring a, a bank, a chartered bank network of a kind of crypto uh, exchange to Europe. Um, and I think they are fine. They're very clever. They're trying to find ways, anticipating, I think, that shutdown of the shadow system that you just referred to, which I agree with is likely, so that they, they will be in, again in the position to take advantage of the regulatory limits that I think are likely there because they are branching out to, to be the chartered version of the, the node on that network. And they also, the other part of their business strategy around the world is to monopolize the plumbing of the wholesale payment system through central banks. So, um, you know, everybody likes to talk about all the retail payment stuff that's being done. But unless you have cryptocurrency via blockchain, it all goes through the same conduits, which are the wholesale payment systems that the big banks and the central banks control. JP Morgan has put all their money on the persistence of that network 
and they have a very strong monopoly position there. So it's you can see that their business model is very much based on this partnership with government persisting. And that's why they're at more than one and a half percent market to book value, because that's a very likely forward looking equilibrium. Paul, if I could just jump in here, though, when we talk about shadow banking, uh, that, in my mind, has a, a negative uh, connotation. And I worry about uh, future explosions uh, in the world of shadow banking and how that's going to not only spill over into the economy as a whole, but onto uh, more traditional uh, mainstream type of financial institutions. And again, we have had two recent, uh, just in recent months, uh, blow ups. One is uh, Archegos uh, and its uh, abuse of total return swaps. And the other is Greensill, which was... Uh, uh, this supply chain financing fiasco. And I have a feeling that technology may be actually increasing the, the likelihood of seeing more such uh, explosions out there in the, in the shadow banking world that are going to spill over into more mainstream finance. And look at the losses that Credit Suisse, for instance, has uh, been, uh, been taking because of, uh, of these two uh, capers. Okay. Um, let, let me uh, give you guys a chance to ask your other panelists some questions here, if you if you have them. Uh, Bert, you have a question for anybody? Would. Um, that, no, I'll let me. St I've been talking a lot, so I'll let uh, someone else uh, jump in here. I have a question for the, the rest of the panel. Are you all, as I am, ready to advocate the breaking up of the big banks if we ever got a politically uh, inclined future that would be willing to do it? Are we at the point where we would be willing as a group to advocate uh, breaking them up? I, I'll say, just to stimulate discussion, I have reached that point. Well, Charlie, I'm surprised that uh, you, you're lining up with Elizabeth Warren because you haven't done that typically in the past. Uh, well, but... No, I agree, Dick. She claims to want to break up the big banks, but they're her best friend. Yeah. I actually want to break up the big banks. Hmm. Well, threatening to break them up is a good way to extract subsidies, exactly. uh, to Charlie's point. Campaign contributions. My guess is, is this not going to happen by, you know, some kind of normal political deal, but it, it, it could well happen after the next crisis. And you know, we can talk about when the next crisis is upon us. When Bert talks about there's these disturbing signs of uh, frauds and, uh, you know, green cell and Archegos, uh, you know, maybe it's the crisis. The next crisis is closer than we think. Uh, uh, and maybe it'll be because of interest rates going up. And that's been mentioned there. But but I think you are you aren't going to have, you know, Charlie Calamaris and Elizabeth Warren sit down and negotiate a political deal to break up the big banks unless there is a big crisis where some of them get into trouble. And uh, but, but, you know, the overall impression I'm getting today and looking at some of the numbers and, and the trends is that the, the banking system is you know kind of close to becoming. Uh, an adjunct of the government. It's like, you know, people in the past have said that the uh, banking should be a public utility. And you remember which, uh, Larry Summers' name was mentioned that there was a discussion in the previous financial crisis on whether we should nationalize the banking system. Uh, so I, I, I wonder if, you know, we, we aren't moving in a direction like that where, you know, the next crisis will trigger some sort of major thing. And we're, I hope it doesn't happen, but, you know, we could well see a government takeover of the banking system. Well, the last crisis certainly increased the consolidation of the banking system dramatically, including, as I mentioned in my remarks, making Merrill Lynch a subsidiary of, uh, of the Bank of America, and it, the, the current Bank of America, and many other such uh, moves. And, and the past crisis, as, as uh, was pointed out, also greatly increased the power of the Fed and the, and the consolidation of, the, uh, of its uh, financial uh, assets and liabilities. I think to answer Charlie's question, we'd have to put it together with Dick's observation that the consolidated few little few little banks and the central bank and politicians pattern is the normal pattern of banking around the world. 
And why do we like that? And I think Charlie gave us the answer. We like it because then you can get maybe uh, eight to 10 people around a luncheon table in the central bank, some CEOs, a minister of finance, a governor of the central bank, and, and uh, tell them what they're going to do. So <laughs> you might say this is fundamentally a question of, of, uh, of politics, of what kind of a, of a society you want uh, with respect to the financial system and of, and of the consolidated system, Charlie argued, I think correctly, is also a, uh, a, an increase of the power of the, of the politicians, including the central bankers among the politicians, uh, so, to direct things through the banks. So Charlie, um, coming back to your newest viewpoint, I remember, I think, from your book, Fragile by Design, and also with discussions we've had before, you're a pretty big fan of the Canadian system with a few large banks and lots of branches. And does the Canadian system have the same government deal problem where the, let, you know, the politicians extract, you know, their pound of flesh, or maybe it's not as bad as the U S maybe, maybe it's better to break up the banking committees. And in fact, it's, Remarkably competitive, despite its consolidation, too. Um, it, it, well, if, if I want to respond though to to the quest to the answers that I got from all of you, it sounds like, and I have to agree with you that Dick's point, uh, it's not going to be too easy for us just out of some ideological belief about what would be good to see a breakup of the banking system. So. I have a, another question. Could we at least break up using antitrust law, the current institution known as the Bank Policy Institute, which is masquerading as a think tank, but actually is a whorehouse. Uh, <laughs> uh, it seems to me like just based on antitrust for coordinating their, their uh, market power, we should be able to get rid of that. Can I get anybody to defend the Bank Policy Institute? Charlie, as uh, one who's uh, consulted to uh, various trade associations over, over the years, the Bank Policy Institute is merely a successor to the, uh, uh, the old Bank Holding Company uh, Association, which uh, existed to look out for the interests of the large banks relative to, to the community banks. That's where a lot of the tension, you know, shall we say trade association uh, uh, contention. Yes, but, but, but unlike its predecessor, many reporters and even some public officials take it seriously as an intellectual contributor. That's what's different. Charlie, this is something to keep you in business of uh, negating uh, what their research comes up with. I should be appreciative. Yeah, that's right. You should be. I need to be educated about my where my interests lie. Thank you. <laughs> Early, a long, long time ago, I had a colleague in the bank who was a small town a Wisconsin banker. He said to me one day, you know, when this business was really good was when we had the county banking committee. I said, OK, Bill, I give up. What was the county banking committee? He said, that's where we had lunch once a month together and set deposit prices and loan prices and standardized <laughs> documents. <laughs> well, well, that's kind of what the Bank Policy Institute's there for. It's all full of ex-Federal Reserve, Reserve officials who are going to write the next uh, legislative <laughs> law that the, that the Congress passes, the Democratic Paul, Congress passes. Paul, let me mention one more anniversary since Canada came up. Um, I, you know, the earlier anniversary I mentioned was the 100th anniversary of the U.S. having the largest number of banks it ever had, more than 30,000. Or Alex, by counting the uh, thrifts, would get it up to 38,000. But uh, it's also the 150th anniversary of the Bank of Canada, uh, not the Bank of Canada, but the Canadian Banking Act of 1871, which was, uh, you know, created the uh, Canadian banking system. And, and the main thing I've learned from studying that history is that the, the, the big, uh, uh, the, the better thing that Canadians did than the U.S. did was to make banking a nationally uh, 
overseen regulated system whereas we in the US grew up with letting the as the states regulate banking in Canada I think has had a much smoother banking history because it made that decision 150 years ago to have federal regulation rather than provincial regulation of of banking and and hence they avoided a lot of the failures we had in the US and and you know they never had to reduce their banks from 30,000 to 4,000 because they never had 30,000 banks and it's kind of a stabler system. So we're thinking of anniversaries. It's the 150th anniversary of this Canadian banking law of 1871. But, but Dick, haven't we really migrated to that in the United States, given that the federal government uh, just totally dominates banking regulation? Well, yeah, we've gotten back to that now. Uh, uh, you know, and the Canadians also, I mean, actually trace their banking ideas to Alexander Hamilton, who's a great hero of mine and Charlie's, maybe the rest of you too. Uh, because when they first started banking in Canada and the system grew up on that, they, they used Hamilton's charter for the Bank of the United States, which was nationwide branch banking. Exactly. And the Bank of Montreal was crafted from the Bank of, of the United States' charter. Right. And, and Canadians readily admit that, you know, that their banking system is based on Hamiltonian principles. And, and they, they kind of chuckle when they say you worked out pretty well for us and it, it didn't work out for the Americans so well when they got away from good Hamiltonian principles. Well, Canada in general is one tenth the size, economically speaking, in right. population and economics and finance, one tenth the size of the United States, more or less. So if the, here's a question for, for my colleagues. If the United States evolved in parallel with Canada, the same amount of banking concentration in a place 10 times as big as, as Canada, how big would the, would the biggest five or six banks be in this country? Presumably a lot bigger even than they are now at three trillion. Yes, and, and if you said on a lending basis, the other thing to, that's kind of interesting is Canada, Canada's loans, bank loans to GDP ratio was almost identical to the US until a few decades ago where it then exceeded it. So Canada has never had a shadow banking system problem because they always innovate their chartering to, to, to avoid having a shadow banking system. So actually on a loan to GDP basis, they have far exceeded the US so they, that problem of shadow banking that started in the U.S. really in the 1960s is not something Canada ever experienced. But Canada also doesn't have GSEs unless you want to consider the uh, Canadian Housing Mortgage uh, of Finance Corporation a, a, a GSE. But I think that's probably one of the best things that they did is not to emulate uh, the U.S.'s uh, adoption of uh, the GSE model. I agree with that, Bert. But as Dick pointed out, it really was a constitutional choice in the 1860s in Canada to have all of its economic policies, including its banking policy, centralized so that they have a kind of, in their constitution, in fact, a reverse of our 10th Amendment, where they specifically enumerate economic powers as national powers. And they also say, and if the national government wants to take any other powers, it can in the future too, a kind of opposite of the 10th Amendment. So you're not, you're not supporting that. What's that? You're not supporting that. No, well, I'm just saying that I think that that has, from at least the banking system standpoint, that's, as Dick pointed out, that explains a lot of the difference. So I need to jump in here because uh, we have about a minute left. And I need to uh, say thanks uh, to all the panelists. They're scholars all. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm glad you could make the time to, to join us all today. Uh, and I hope the audience, um, you know, benefited from, from our discussion. And uh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Great right. job. Yeah, thanks a lot. On your great paper, Paul. Thanks for inviting us. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.